Good morning. Let me welcome you to this joint seminar organized by CMA Sri Lanka in collaboration with Center for Bhutan and the Gross National Happiness Studies in Bhutan. So we are very happy to welcome you to this uh, webinar that we've organized today on Gross National Happiness. And uh, we have a very, very uh, eminent uh, panel who are present with us today uh, from uh, Bhutan. And I must uh, thank uh, the uh, Center for Bhutan and GNH Studies for helping us to organize and also to invite the eminent speakers for this seminar that we are having today. So we will have with us, uh, we have uh, the uh, Dr. Dasho Karmaura, who is the president of Center for Bhutan and GNH Studies. Then we also have Dasho Rinchan Wangdi, who is the secretary of the Ross National Happiness uh, Commission. Dr. Sabina Alkaya, the di uh, di director of OPHI, University of Oxford. And Shoki Sangmo, uh, the senior researcher at uh, CBS. From uh, CMA, we've also invited some of our council members and experts. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Rujira Pereira, who is a member of our council. We have uh, Mr. Kosala Jisanayaka, who is a consultant uh, director. And uh, we've invited a very special guest, uh, Mrs. Anoja Vijayasekara, who's uh, spent a long time in Bhutan. She was with uh, UNICEF and five to six years. So I'm sure uh, that she knows uh, most of you who are speaking today and uh, very, very thankful for her for accepting our invitations uh, to be with us. Uh, and also to serve on the panel and maybe uh, make some useful comments and uh, questions. Uh, about the uh, two organizations, now, of course, CMA, uh, as you know, is the uh, Institute of Certified Management Accountants of Sri Lanka, which is the national professional management accounting body in Sri Lanka incorporated by an act of uh, parliament and uh, mainly involved in the uh, provision of uh, management accountancy. We have about 18,000 students who are doing our program and uh, 2,500 members uh, of our institute. We are also members of the uh, International Federation of Accountants, uh, the global body for the accounting profession and the South Asian Federation of Accountants, which looks after the South Asian region, uh, including Bhutan, but uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we are uh, from the South Asian Federation taking necessary action to help the uh, Bhutan Accounting Standards Committee to, uh, as soon as possible, to get their act uh, passed in parliament so that uh, they could become full members of SAPA. At the moment, they are an observer. So we are very happy to be uh, involved with them. Uh, in addition to that, I must also say that uh, uh, we have links with Bhutan. That's with our management body, which is called the uh, Chartered Professional Manager. And uh, we are members of the Association of Management Development Institutions in South Asia. And the Bhutan uh, University uh, are members of that. So uh, on the management side, we have the uh, them as members on our body, plus uh, uh, they are actively involved in the activity. So we are very happy that we've had uh, uh, links with uh, Bhutan in these various activities. Uh, then on the CB, about CBS, of course, I'm sure that uh, uh, Dr. Dasho, Dr. Karmaura would be able to tell more, but I will just briefly say that uh, that the Center for Bhutan and GNH Studies, CBS, is an independent research organization under the Royal Government of Bhutan. It carries out uh, research on a wide range of social, cultural, economic, and political issues. GNH being one of the main focuses of 
their research. Since the beginning, CBS has engaged in developing the Gross National Happiness Index, measuring it through the conduct of nationwide GNH survey, surveys every five years. The president of the center is Dasho Karmaura, and the office is located in Timbu. So, in fact, uh, Dr. Dasho uh, Karmaura is present here today. So, we are very happy that uh, uh, he is uh, personally present and will be addressing us today. Uh, in addition to that, I think I can say that uh, the Gross National Happiness Index has uh, uh, also taken uh, a lot of prominence uh, in the global sphere. Uh, I know the, uh, the short of uh, connections that they have with the Harvard University, uh, where they conduct a number of research and uh, seminars. Then, of course, with uh, uh, the Oxford uh, University, where Sabina Alkair is there. So, uh, globally, there is also the index, uh, the Global Happiness Index. Uh, of course, in Sri Lanka, we uh, are still dependent on the uh, gross national product, but uh, happiness is something that is in the mind, minds of everyone, especially as a Buddhist country, uh, happiness is something that everyone wants. And, and this is something, uh, uh, this seminar uh, uh, is being organized in order to see the benefits uh, that uh, we could derive uh, from uh, this seminar, because uh, uh, people say that uh, maybe uh, if, if you are a very, very wealthy person, you have happiness, uh, but actually uh, that may not be true. So uh, happiness has various many other factors, which I'm sure that we can listen, whether you're rich or poor, uh, you can be happy, you know, so it does not mean that wealth is the only thing. And uh, uh, the society needs to realize uh, that uh, the main aim, even in a business organization, in your workplace, uh, whatever you do, that ultimate uh, goal would be to achieve uh, happiness. And if everyone is happy, I'm sure uh, the country uh, would be a very, very successful uh, place. And I'm sure that uh, uh, Bhutan has uh, played a major role in uh, taking this uh, forward. So I would uh, now uh, briefly introduce our the first speaker uh, who will be giving an introduction to gross national happiness. That will be the show uh, Dr. Karma Ura. Uh, he uh, studied uh, in St. Stephen's uh, uh, College in Delhi, the Oxford University, uh, Edinburgh University, Nagoya University, uh, and is the president of the Center for Bhutan Studies and GNH. His career has spanned interest in the development of goals, statistics, and indication, indicators, and their policy applications, and Buddhist literature, fine arts, and philosophy. He has bestowed order of uh, Druk Holo, Wheel of Dragon Kingdom, by His Majesty the King, for his contribution for literature and fine arts. The Government of India awarded him the Vaisak Samman Prahasti Patra for 2020 in recognition of his scholarship and fine arts in Buddhism. His latest two volumes on Bhutan will be published this year by Oxford University Press. He is an advisory member of World Happiness Report, the Wellbeing Center of Oxford University, and the School of Wellbeing, Chulongkorn University in, Bang in Bangkok. So I would now warmly welcome. Uh, Dasho, Dr. Karma Ura, to speak to us on the introduction to gross na national happiness. Over to you, Dr. Dasho Karma Ura. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Lakshman, um, for your kind introduction. Uh, I thank Jimmy Finso, who is in the background, uh, coordinating with you this uh, conference. I like to also uh, greet uh, uh, Dr. Anuja, who's been our UNICEF uh, rep here for a long time, and uh, uh, Mr. Kosala, and uh, also uh, Ms., uh, uh, Ruchira, uh, and to 
uh, and also welcome the uh, rest of the uh, um, uh, participants and panelists. Uh, I should say that uh, uh, Secretary of Honorable Secretary of Cross National Happiness, uh, Dr. Rinshin Wangchi, uh, could join us, although he's in sort of a semi lockdown mode in his office. Um, uh, I should say that uh, cross national happiness is a sort of a national socioeconomic planning body which prepares five year plans in Bhutan and incorporates uh, uh, cross national happiness uh, programs and projects uh, wherever possible. So he is in the execution uh, side, uh, whereas our uh, institute is in uh, the side of research and policy analysis. I also like to welcome uh, Choki Zangmo. Uh, uh, she was a, a key member of our office, uh, especially uh, uh, she was uh, critical in the development of uh, the gross national certification for corporations or companies. Uh, uh, along with uh, uh, some of our colleagues like Jimmy Finso and Karma Wangi. But she is now in United uh, UNDP in Bhutan. I must, uh, I must uh, uh, point that out. And lastly, I would like to welcome our uh, uh, um, uh, long time um, intellectual partner on the, road, on the journey of GNH, uh, Professor uh, Sabina al -Khair. Uh, from Oxford University. Uh, I should say that she uh, contributed hugely to the gross national happiness. Uh, on the technical side, uh, it is her uh, method of aggregation, and that is to say the core of statistical method uh, was invented by her and her colleague James Foster. So we are um, also very happy to uh, have her uh, speak to you about uh, uh, that and many other things. Uh, or incidentally, I should say that she is a global poverty expert. So with that, uh, may I um, uh, sort of uh, 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 welcome you all uh, to our, uh, by introducing the panel from our side. And they, will, they are more than sort of uh, um, uh, qualified to answer any question later on, you know, any spectrum of questions you have on the practical, conceptual, and the statistical sides. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me say that uh, uh, we are here in the midst of uh, uh, conducting training uh, for enumerators to launch a, a gross national happiness survey uh, once again. Be uh, um, so, so gross national happiness is a uh, uh, survey-based uh, uh, index, and every four years uh, or so, uh, about eight thousand uh, households are sampled randomly uh, to go through the uh, uh, rather large number of structured and uh, open-ended questions. Um, uh, and for that purpose, we engage some hundred enumerators and the survey lasts four or five uh, months um, to be completed. And uh, of course, of subsequent to that, we do analysis and findings are then presented to the government. And most importantly, the focal uh, uh, sort of recipient of our survey result is the Gross National Happiness Commission, uh, which is uh, represented by Dashurin Chinwangdi today amongst us. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as regards our office, uh, uh, Professor Lakshman already introduced. Uh, 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 is a, a, a autonomous, semi-autonomous uh, research center, and uh, it has uh, today about uh, more than 100 uh, graduate and postgraduates doing all sort of uh, uh, policy-related uh, research. Um, so it is uh, relatively big now, uh, the office is big. Uh, uh, 
uh, Professor Lakshman mentioned uh, that uh, the aspiration of uh, all individuals, whether in Bhutan or Sri Lanka, at the end is uh, experience of well-being and happiness. Uh, however you define it, individuals do realize uh, when they uh, are within reach of uh, this kind of uh, states, both spiritual, uh, uh, mental, and physical. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, aim of individual is uh, uh, quite obvious and quite well known uh, amongst all uh, amongst all communities across the world. I think the uh, innovation that happened uh, through the uh, creativity of the fourth king of Bhutan is that he didn't leave this individual aspiration at the individual level. Uh, he tapped into it and tried to make it into uh, a point of government action. And there are many functions a government discharges, as you know, from uh, security, justice, poverty elevation, environmental preservation, um, to infrastructure provision and economic stabilization. The list can uh, be endless. Uh, but uh, as Professor uh, Lakshman mentioned, that uh, at the end of it, this must distill uh, to uh, the uh, contentment and happiness and well-being of the present and future generations. So, uh, so uh, His Majesty the Fourth King sort of uh, 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 transformed that uh, collective aspiration into uh, 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 individual aspiration to collective actions. Uh, collective action and the, at the forefront of collection action is of course many organizations, uh, NGOs, communities, uh, uh, religious uh, uh, organization, but uh, uh, we all acknowledge that the role of government is rather uh, prominent uh, and uh, uh, overriding. And so if the government uh, does not exhibit any interest in collective well-being and happiness, uh, the uh, the result of all other efforts by all other parties or agencies can be somewhat limited. So I think this is the important point that uh, the uh, the aspiration and the aim of individuals uh, are recognized by the government. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, so the sort of uh, forging ahead towards well-being and happiness does not uh, take place in sort of uh, contradictory terms. Individuals desire one thing, but the government doesn't acknowledge it uh, fully, is, uh, is uh, not going to be absolutely efficient or uh, fruitful. So that is the really uh, um, uh, 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 experiment uh, launched uh, by the fourth king of Bhutan. Uh, now, of course, he has been succeeded by the fifth king, uh, his son, but the uh, uh, <clears throat> attention uh, given by the fifth king and the government of Bhutan is uh, um, the of the same vigor and the same uh, uh, same level, <coughs> uh, uh, same uh, level. Um, can you hear me, Professor Lakshman? Is it problematic? No, no, I can hear you. No problem. Yeah, it's very good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that is uh, <clears throat> that is the background. Uh, now um, um, uh, uh, all such generalizations are well known to all of you, distinguished people. Uh, you might uh, uh, only um, uh, doubt what difference does it all make? What? what, what 
how does it uh, become distinctive in uh, in governance in Bhutan? And uh, for this purpose, may I uh, refer uh, briefly to the difference uh, in the findings, the main difference in the findings in the past two successive uh, past two successive uh, surveys. Uh, uh, we found out that uh, in the past two surveys, uh, uh, two domains of gross national happiness, you will hear this, I'm sure, a little more from my distinguished colleagues, gross national happiness is framed in terms of focus on nine areas in life, uh, psychological well-being, community vitality, uh, balanced use of time over 24 hours, health, education, environment, good governance, uh, cultural um, vitality, and uh, uh, living standards. So these are nine areas. Um, uh, you see that all this have begun to um, uh, receive a great deal of attention all around the world culture, health, education, living standard, um, uh, uh, environment, etc. Uh, yet to receive a great deal of attention around the world, uh, we might uh, say our you know, psychological well-being, uh, balanced use of time over 24 hours, and community vitality. I think these are also beginning to register on government, um, both local and central uh, around the world, because they are also very vital inputs into the uh, into well-being and happiness objectives. So we have found that in the past two successive surveys, uh, psychological well-being and community vitality uh, domains indicators have declined. And there can be many reasons uh, for uh, uh, this. Uh, community vitality, uh, which is measured in terms of uh, non-transactional or non-monetary support given by one member of a society, community, neighborhood, or village to another in terms of social support, in terms of uh, uh, free time contribution, uh, you know, or in terms of uh, the safety trust level of communities, uh, this declined a little bit in Bhutan. And I think this is also a general phenomenon all around the world. So, but we need some ways of uh, um, uh, objectively measuring this sort of uh, phenomena. And this was revealed in the GNH survey. Now, if you don't do this kind of survey, uh, probably uh, there is no objective way to reveal this uh, to the government. So um, this has been done in Bhutan and also in terms of uh, psychological well-being. Uh, it is quite apparent that in the uh, um, progress we make in material terms, um, very often uh, hidden the inner uh, um, interior side of of human being uh, sort of uh, gets highly conflicted. Uh, there are many dilemmas. And so the negative uh, emotions rise, positive emotions fall. Um, um, things like mind, time for mindfulness and uh, time for meditation, or et cetera, um, uh, decreases or the level of social disconnection, disorientation, and loneliness increases. So this can impact psychological well-being, particularly in the COVID times. So anyway, uh, psychological well-being and uh, community vitality also declined in this country where during the past two successive uh, surveys we know. And, and uh, because of this finding, we are able to put to the government, uh, uh, you know, the areas where they need to pay some uh, better or attention uh, um, or make uh, further adjustments uh, through investment and programs. Uh, so uh, uh, this is the difference uh, gross national happiness has made uh, um, 
that would not have happened if you are only looking at economic side through GDP and the macroeconomic framework. Uh, um, but there are also other technical uses of GNH uh, metrics in this country. And if I may uh, bring to your kind attention the um, uh, practical application at the uh, technical and professional level. Uh, first of all, uh, the indicators of GNH uh, related to the nine domains, uh, some of them are used as national targets during the framing of the five-year plan uh, uh, in this country. Uh, Dasho Rinchen can uh, elaborate on that further. I am sure he will. Uh, Secondly, uh, during the uh, annual budget allocations, uh, the, uh, the lowest levels of our country, uh, these are called geoks or counties, there are 205 of them, and uh, the capital budget uh, allocated to them uh, is determined by a formula, and the formula is heavily influenced by gross national happiness indicators. So 40% of capital budget. What it means is that uh, those who are not doing so well in terms of GNH indicators get more money. That's, uh, that's the logic. Uh, the third uh, way, uh, again, I'm sure Dasha Rinchen will elaborate this much more, is that whenever government proposes a new policy, the policy is uh, checked, scrutinized, analyzed, and passed according to something called GNH policy screening tools. And uh, another way GNH is uh, uh, technically applied in this country is that the uh, businesses, uh, some of the public corporations uh, are assessed according to GNH business certification that Karma Wangdi and Sokid and uh, his, uh, their colleagues developed. Now this also, what, it, uh, what, it, uh, what is the import of this is that we can influence the environment around us in two, three ways. One is through the government uh, investment, government policies, government legislation, etc. The other one is really the world of business or corporations. And if their behavior and values are also not influenced by gross national happiness, uh, values, then uh, these two can uh, diverge. So uh, the application of GNS business certification, which is uh, different and distinctive from corporate social responsibilities or benefit corporation, uh, is to align the business behavior and business path with GNS. And we have begun a, a modest journey of uh, on this by assessing uh, three biggest corporations in this country, Bhutan Telecommunication, Bhutan Power Corporation, Bhutan Bank, uh, Bank of Bhutan, etc. And the next assessment will be done on uh, Druk Green Power Corporation, which will be the, this is the holding company of all the uh, uh, hydropower centers in the hydropower stations in this country. So, the, uh, and also GNH is technically applied uh, to uh, assessing impact of big projects, uh, but that we have been able to do only one big project, although the methodology has been developed. So these are some of the uh, uh, practical difference essays it is uh, uh, GNH is uh, making in the governance and of the corporations and uh, or agencies of the government. Um, but of course, uh, uh, equally important uh, role of GNH is uh, in uh, discourse, you know, uh, uh, discussions uh, in order to keep the uh, consciousness uh, of the people uh, uh, also on happiness and well being. Uh, this is not a small um, uh, thing to keep the consciousness uh, and uh, uh, focus of the people on this is not a small thing because you can be um, taken in another direction by another type of disc discourse all the time. If you are discussing only uh, um, corporate performance or government uh, performance in terms of GDP, uh, you can imagine uh, the room and the space for discussing the fundamental thing about human being can be quite compromised. Um, 
and and now of course uh, uh, i should say that uh, uh, towards well being and happiness there are many types of inputs uh, many types of input and uh, gdp one can consider is one type of input but there are equally other intangible uh, inputs. I just mentioned one or two of them: uh, balanced use of time, community vitality, and uh, uh, psychological well-being, etc. Uh, so, uh, so, what you might uh, uh, see uh, in many countries is a, a tremendous overemphasis on the living standard, that is, the material conditions of life, material conditions of life, which is a very important. A part of uh, uh, well-being and happiness, uh, since uh, material deprivations uh, is uh, may, uh, biggest uh, one of the major uh, um, sort of thing scarring life uh, towards happiness and well-being. But uh, uh, equally, one must not forget, as you all know, distinguished uh, participants, uh, the immaterial and the social and the communal and the psychological inputs into. Uh, into well-being and happiness. So, um, how am I doing with my time? With time? Yeah. Okay. Uh, depending. Uh, maybe another ten minutes, or depending on how we want to do it. Is it enough? Or? No, I can stop. Also, I can really oh, no. stop. No, no, no yes. problem. Because I think you can go on. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, um, 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 so the so I I think the there's been a, um, a general uh, general awakening around the world, general awakening around the world uh, that uh, mm, happiness, well-being uh, uh, has uh, to um, receive a little more balanced uh, uh, attention. Uh, for many reasons, for many reasons, uh, for many reasons, uh, as you all know, uh, and therefore, uh, um, OECD um, also has uh, pioneered its own version of uh, well-being. Uh, you know, um, many other organizations have set up their own national bodies taking uh, uh, taking a deeper look at it um, um, so i think the uh, the uh, scenario in the world seems to be changing uh, 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 not 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 in the least because of the uh, um, the we the world world as we know it is uh, facing uh, facing has faced uh, uh, has faced uh, many uh, global uh, catastrophic scenario climate change inequality uh, so and so forth uh, you know uh, on a planetary scale on a planetary scale. Uh, at the same time, uh, lack of attention uh, at a sort of a, a, um, public policy level of uh, all the hidden things uh, that mars our life, uh, trauma, alienation, loneliness, uh, stress, uh, dissatisfaction, phobia, all sort of things like this uh, require us to rebalance our focus requires us to rebalance our focus. Um, can we obtain higher well-being and happiness at lesser cost to the planet? Can we obtain higher uh, well-being, happiness at a, um, you know, by making a world a little more egalitarian? Can we make uh, people a world happier by reducing the humdrum of uh, a tremendous uh, pressure of modern life. All these questions uh, require us to uh, take up a different sort of agenda. And that is why all around the world, even if the governments are not interested, you can see a surge in interest at the community level, 
at the sub government sub 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 uh, sub national level i would say sort of uh, districts prefectures municipalities uh, they're much more agile in they they uh, they pick up this uh, progressive ideas and actions uh, uh, much faster i think than the central government we see you know we see so uh, and of course uh, coming back to uh, bhutan and to sri lanka you know one of the uh, 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 you know shared uh, uh, fundamentals of our uh, societies are uh, deep buddhist values and buddhist ideas and in buddhist ideas as you all know um, contentment of all sentient beings has been a uh, sort of a primary uh, primary uh, um, uh, trait primary trait and we can uh, we might uh, even claim and that uh, uh, Lord Buddha himself was the biggest investigator in this field, you know, 2,500 years ago. Um, um, the characterizations of uh, the cause uh, of suffering, uh, cause of unease, uh, the cause of malfunctioning of our body and mind, uh, uh, um, um, have been surprisingly uh, uh, kind of uh, um, surprisingly and uh, in a deep analytical way uh, established by him. Uh, where can we find, for example, 2005 years, uh, 500 years, uh, characterization of mental phenomena into 52 different kinds? Uh, we find it in Buddhism. So uh, by uh, our uh, long and rich heritage, of course, much longer and richer in Sri Lanka than Bhutan, I would like to say, because uh, um, the Pali canons, uh, these are uh, sort of things which have been preserved much better in your un country with uninterrupted history. Uh, uh, and uh, Bhutan also, since 8th century, uh, much more alive to this kind of ideas. So uh, it's been, uh, uh, we can say that we, it's, it's slightly easier to recruit uh, uh, social uh, economic policies in this uh, direction of happiness and well-being. And I won't be surprised if you do that also in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, you know, through uh, uh, all of your uh, efforts, um, uh, all of your efforts. You. So I think uh, I will, um, I will uh, pause here and to allow uh, my distinguished colleagues to uh, take further, you know. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Daso Dr. Karma Ura. I think uh, you gave a very, very uh, uh, deep uh, meaning to uh, gross national happiness and as to how uh, the public sector and the private sector, the business sector, how uh, they should also gain by this, uh, by creating happiness. One of the most important things, it, it's not only the material well-being, but also the other areas uh, that uh, go into it and uh, uh, the uh, you also mentioned about maybe on the, the lesser costs of the reducing problems and other areas uh, which uh, you had uh, uh, mentioned uh, and of course the cause of uh, suffering i think uh, you also mentioned on uh, the buddhism uh, but uh, i i also want to just to tell you something that uh, as a professional accounting body that uh, we, what we did uh, recently, uh, which is connected with this uh, gross national happiness uh, uh, index uh, and the uh, policy that is concerned, because recently, actually it was last uh, week, uh, we, uh, uh, we recognized uh, companies that had created value to the uh, society. Because normally people are only looking at the profit. So here it is both the financial and the non-financial uh, 
uh, areas that we are considering. So that's a uh, yeah, very, very important area. And today, even companies are looking as to the value that they can create uh, for the society, uh, which, uh, of course, is maybe not only the profit that they are making. So uh, I think this also has a, a close connection with the gross national happiness that uh, uh, Dr. Dharma was uh, speaking on, and I'm sure that uh, uh, we, we have so many areas which we now may have to bring it uh, into this uh, gross national happiness uh, index that is there. So uh, let me thank you. But before I close, I think since uh, uh, Dr. Anoja is here, because she knows you very well, she's been there for a long time with the UN. Uh, uh, would you like to uh, say a few words uh, before uh, Dr. Karma Ura leaves, uh, Dr. Anuja? Yeah, I'd just like to say uh, congratulations to Bhutan on how you have uh, progressed with uh, gross national happiness. Because the time that I was in Bhutan, you were still talking about the indicators of uh, measuring gross national happiness. So from what you have said, uh, you have come a long way. And I'm extremely impressed that you are conducting these surveys and you are getting a feedback from the population. Because I think that is the missing link of most of the other indicators that we have in the world, including, including the Human Development uh, uh, Index of the United Nations. Even that doesn't uh, take into account what you are considering uh, which is psychological well-being and, you know, even things like uh, the feeling of safety. And also, I'm extremely impressed that, you know, with, with these surveys, you have a feedback mechanism from which you are giving that, uh, uh, giving the findings of your surveys to the government so that they can then uh, fine-tune their policies and also, I'm very impressed that your budget is determined. The budget at the GEOG level is uh, determined by the GNH indicators. So you have a two-way system of uh, implementing policies and then getting a feedback from the people themselves. And I think that is the missing ingredient in the world, in the entire world. I don't think there is any country in the world that conducts this kind of survey. So I would like to say congratulations and best wishes with your GNH. Thank you, Dr. Anoja. There is uh, one question, uh, uh, Dr. Karma, I'll just read it out before you go. I see, I see where the literacy level is high, say about 80%, or where GDP is high, GNH is low. Is there any relations on this? That is. Uh, uh, so the question is where the GNH uh, index is high, the GDP is low. Is that so? Uh, the, where the GDP, no, they say uh, where GDP is high. Uh, no, let me say, I see where the literacy level, uh, literacy level is say, uh, high, about 80%. And mm. uh, where GDP is high, GNH is low. Uh, that is gross, gross uh, national, yeah, it's low, yeah. Where the, in, uh, where the literacy level and the GDP are high, they say <laughs> that the GNH is low. Uh, 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 I'm not uh, uh, at, at this moment, uh, um, uh, uh, completely, um, complete, I cannot remember completely. Uh, the question must be referring to the comparison across the districts uh, because we have information about the income level at the district as well as GNH scores at the district level. So uh, the uh, contrast that the question is trying to raise must be about these performances at the district level between GNH, GDP, and literacy. Uh, so now, uh, uh, 
what we uh, what i can remember just now uh, not the numbers but the general achievement level is that the gnh is very high uh, in uh, districts such as uh, uh, central bhutanese districts of bumthang uh, of uh, i think gasa and such uh, places uh, now these are not the uh, top uh, districts from the gdp point of view but they are top from the gnh point of view uh, in terms of gdp uh, also the districts such as the capital district of thimpu and paro ought to be very uh, they are the top but they are not high in terms of gnh so the gdp and gnh uh, are measuring different uh, different things uh the third uh, factor which you mentioned literacy i don't think this has a decisive role in determining the position of gnh or gdp you know it is only one of the many 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 inputs in the uh, creation of G, G, gnh or gdp so i don't think they are the this is the ruling factor i don't think it's the ruling factor the ruling factor must be is something else so uh, if we just keep the contrast between gnh and gdp uh, conclusion is that uh, where the gdp is um, high gnh is not necessarily high uh, uh, and we know why uh, all the distinguished members would know why uh, because uh, uh, gdp is a much narrower much narrower uh, measure and it measures really really the material conditions of living standard so we know that uh, living standard is racing ahead in bhutan uh, racing ahead because the uh, in the past the gdp growth rate in bhutan as dr anujan knows as has been fairly high about 7 8% per annum so it's uh, but uh, gnh doesn't race forward uh, in the same at the same rate or pace because it considers so many factors so many factors so it is a multidimensional uh, measurement incorporating uh, accounting on some sort of uh, um uh, uh, um uh, some some uh, 200 uh, variables so that's a very a large set of data which goes into gnh measurement so when you measure so many things both tangible and intangible we know we also know from experience that a lot of things are going backward but that is precisely the value of this kind of multidimensional index it focuses also things that matter but things that do not get always uh, measurement uh, focus so that's why uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, the rise in G gnh uh, numbers uh, would not be as impressive as gdp at all at the same time i'm sure that the fall in gnh will also be not as uh, uh, vulnerable as gdp you know uh, you know gdp uh, for example during this covid period i find we find uh, lots of anecdotes uh, that uh, community vitality is uh, still re-stimulated because you know people depend on each other people respond to this uh, need for dependence you know uh, so so uh, in conclusion i would say that they measure different things therefore uh, they are going to uh, they are going to uh, um, uh, they are going to uh, have a, a the ranking of the districts are going to be different depending on gnh or uh, gdp rankings are going to be different thank you okay thank thank you very much uh, dasho dr karma ura we are very thankful for you for uh, getting your organization to organize this seminar and also i know that you have to leave so let me thank you once again and uh, we will be in touch with you and we do hope that we will be able to take this forward and we can form uh, alliance uh, with uh, CMS Sri Lanka and CBS uh, in order yes. that uh, we can uh, promote uh, 
uh, the GNH and the GNH index uh, in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much and all the very best of you. Thank right. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And the next item is uh, the address on the gross national happiness into practice, which includes the policy planning and budgeting. To uh, give this address, uh, I would invite uh, Daso Ring, Ringchen Wangdi, uh, who is currently serving as the Secretary of the Gross National Happiness Commission. Before that, he served as the director of the GNH Commission Secretariat since 2018. Prior to joining GNHC, Dasho Rinshan has served in the Ministry of Finance for more than 15 years. Dasho has more than 27 years of experience on the management and public administration of running government affairs in different capacities and worked very closely with numerous development partners at various levels who are actively engaged in Bhutan's socio-economic development. He has a master's in economics of development from Australian National University, ANU, Canberra, Australia. So I have now great pleasure in inviting Daso Rinchen Wangdi uh, to address us. Mm, thank you. Thank you, moderator, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Shukaramura uh, and Professor Lakshman, and also the Institute of uh, Certified Management Accountant, CMA, Sri Lanka, for inviting me uh, and giving this uh, opportunity to speak on the GNH. Uh, it is an honor uh, for me to be part of this seminar with uh, highly, among the highly di uh, distinguished speakers. And I would also like to thank and welcome all the participants attending this, uh, today's seminar. As Trasho Karmora has mentioned and highlighted the mandates of GNH Commission and uh, GNH Commission Secretary is the end user of the research findings of the seminar, I mean the uh, service conducted by the uh, Center for Potential Studies and GNH Center. So, let me share my screen here. You have to unmute, uh, Dasho. Rinchen, you have to. So is it okay? The... Yeah, now fine, now fine. Okay. okay. So uh, today I'll be speaking on the operationalizing the cross national happiness. Uh, if you go to the my uh, presentation outline, uh, I have prepared my presentation in three parts. First, the introduction on the concept of GNH from a development perspective. Second, I would like to briefly highlight some of the key measures to ensure the pursuit of GNH. And third, on the application of GNH uh, in policy making policy making, planning and budgeting, which would be the center theme of my uh, presentation. So firstly, uh, what is GNH? I think uh, for many people, it means uh, different to uh, different people, but uh, from the Bhutan, the GNH Commission Secretary, we defined uh, GNH as the Bhutan's holistic approach to development that seeks to 
balance and create the right condition for people to maximize happiness. Uh, it is. Uh, it was propounded by His Majesty the Fourth uh, King in 1970s. 1970s, when he said that gross national happiness is more important uh, than gross domestic product. What does it mean by development? Is there a cost to development? Therefore, JNH calls for a development with values in a balanced manner between material prosperity and mental spiritual well-being of the citizens. On the on the JNH, uh, uh, we when we mention the gross national happiness uh, uh, philosophy, it constitutes of around nine domains and thirty three indicators and one hundred and twenty four variables. So nine domains captures the aspirations of the people of Bhutan. The nine domains include. Uh, conventional domains like health, education, living standard, time use, good governance, ecological diversity and resilience. And it also includes non-conventional domains such as uh, the psychological well-being, community vitality and cultural diversity and resilience. These domains, the nine domains remind us to incorporate all vital aspects of the well being into our plans and action. For example, the psychological well being, the, the key elements within that is the life expectation, life satisfaction, spirituality, positive emotions, negative emotions. And when it comes to health, it's mental health, self reported health status, health, healthy days and disability. When it comes to education, it, it includes literacy, schooling, knowledge, and values. For the time use, it's between the balance between the work and uh, sleep. On the cultural diversity and resilience, the elements are uh, speaking native language, cultural participation, artistic uh, skills, and Diglam Namsha, the national ethic. Under good governance, the government's performance, fundamental rights, services, and political participation. Under community vitality, the elements are donations, time and money, community leadership, family and safety. Under ecological diversity and resilience, we have ecological issues, responsibility to us environment, wildlife damage, rural and urbanization issues, under living standards, the last one, assets, housing and house, household per capita income. In this slide, uh, uh, the, the article nine, section two of the constitution of the kingdom of Bhutan state state, the state shall strive to promote those conditions that will enable the pursuit of uh, gross national happiness. So what are the measures taken to ensure the pursuit of GNH? Of the many initiatives taken by different stakeholders, some direct and key initiative to ensure <coughs> the pursuit of GNH, uh, creation of uh, GNH index, uh, establishment of GNH Commission Secretariat, conducting GNH surveys on a periodic intervals, and using its result and findings to formulate plans, programs, and policies. The GNH index, uh, it will be uh, uh, covered under Dr. Sabine's uh, presentation. However, uh, the GNH index measures how happy we are as a country and provides the framework for our development. It also provides a holistic indicator of our development progress. It helps us to understand how many people are happy and their level of happiness. 
the level of happiness in turn enable us to understand the areas in which they lack that restrain them from being happy. It also helps us to curate our interventions and allocate our resources, which I'll explain further later. The index ranges from one to zero to one, zero being most unhappy and one being the happiest. The closer the value to one, the happier the nation. In 2010, the GNS index value was 0.743. Uh, uh, and in 2015, it was 0.756, meaning that the happiness level as a society has improved comparatively. In 2010, 40.9% of the population were happy. And in 2015, 43.39% were happy. So relatively uh, increase in the happiness index. On the GNH survey, uh, uh, the, this is one of the means to operationalize GNH. Uh, and uh, we conduct every four to five years the GNH surveys by the Center for Bhutan and GNH Studies. The survey results show the country and the society's happiness and well being across nine domains by indicators, by region, by rural urban areas by gender, by marital status, and occupational groups. Excluding the pilot survey in 2008, the first survey was conducted in 2010 and second one in 2015. The next survey is planned this year. On the, uh, the creation of a uh, GNH Commission Secretariat. Uh, in terms of institutional setup and ensuring that GNH is pursued and mainstream in two spirit through the plans, policy, and programs, the Elsewhere Planning Commission was renamed as the GNH Commission Secretariat in 2007. GNH is the center coordinating agency that steers national national social economic development guided by the principle of GNH and to promote GNH. In collaboration with the sectors and agencies, GNH coordinates and mainstream GNH in policy making, planning and budgeting. We also review and ensure that development cooperation programs are GNH friendly through programs and project formulation. Uh, within the GNH Commission Secretary, we have divisions that facilitates development planning, monitoring and evaluation of plans, policies and activities of center agencies and local government. Uh, the, when it comes to application of GNH in policy making, uh, uh, practicing what we actually preach, uh, if you look at the, uh, the slide, the the presentation, which is on the application of GNH. First, it is on the uh, GNH in pl planning, uh, policy planning. We have uh, instituted a pro policy protocol in place. One of the defining characteristics of the protocol is that all public policies integrate GNH and other cross-cutting issues and all public policies that originate from the government agencies should be screened through the GNH policy screen tool to ensure that policies foster enabling environment for pursuit of happiness. And I, here I, I would like to qualify that the right now we are focusing only on only the policies that originate from the government agencies. And uh, the GNH screen tool assesses and reviews the perceived impact of all the draft policies on GNH particularly on 22 variables linked to the nine domains. The policies that lack in certain indicators are recommended for review to ensure it creates conducive conditions for happiness. On the, the 
again, to continue uh, the in terms of policy screening exercise, it is being conducted by the sectors proposing the policy and by, by, and by the GNH Commission Secretary. 10 to 15 people of various backgrounds and occupation screens the policy. Score of one to four. Score of one to four uh, is awarded depending upon the perceived impact of the policy on the variable. One representing negative impact, two uncertain, three no uh, negative impact and not applicable, and four positive impact. Uh, so these are the scores and reasons. Uh, they, we have a guidelines uh, to the scoring. And on the each uh, variable, a uh, score of uh, three is considered to have a favorable impact on the variable. And in total, a score of 63, three times 22, each uh, a variable will carry three. So it is set as threshold for the policy to be GNH favorable. So, in continuation, again, since the adopt, adoption of a screening tool in 2009, around 45 policies are found to be GNH favorable, one as GNH non favorable, and four are in process of screening. Besides the policy screening, GNH survey results findings informs and directs the policy making. So, now when, uh, when it comes to the application of GNH uh, in planning, uh, the main strategic framework and the long-term goal of every five-year plan is to maximize the uh, gross national happiness as uh, depicted in the diagram. And uh, uh, we are in currently, we are in the 12 five-year plan. The 12 five-year plan started in 2018 and it will end in 2018. Three, and on the on the framework uh, of the planning, uh, since the 10 5 year plan, 2008, uh, the GNS index and findings of GNS service have been used to guide plan formulation and monitoring. Progress of plan is measured against the key performance indicators to assess its contribution to the key result area towards the realization of the five-year plan objective and maximization of GNH. So here, when we talk about the framework of the planning, this uh, framework is fixed irrespective of the comment of the day. Uh, any political parties coming into the government, they'll have to go by the, the framework that has been already finalized. And uh, we also take into account the the 2030 agenda, the sustainable development goals, and these are closely mapped and linked and also integrated in the GNS framework. The plan and activities of uh, sectors are also monitored and measured through a mechanism such as uh, the government performance management system, the annual performance uh, agreement, annual meteor uh, uh, review, annual midterm review, midterm review of the five-year plan and also the terminal review of the five-year plan. Besides that, uh, separate project steering committees and project management units are also instituted and track the progress and quality of the implementation. Uh, the prem, this, this is the uh, framework of how we map plan objectives and the national key result area against the domains of uh, the GNH for integration. Each national uh, key area, the national outcome, helps to achieve either one or more domains of the GNH. So on this topic, uh, uh, Ms. Tsukizamu will be presenting in detail. However, 
just to highlight that besides common government agencies, plans and programs, private and business firms are also assessed on their contribution to GNH through certification to ensure the commitment to social responsibility. Uh, the total, the tool assesses the two components of organizational commitment and workers' happiness across the domains. So far, three, uh, the state-owned enterprises, the Bank of Bhutan, Bhutan Power Corporation, and Bhutan Telecom Limited were awarded the GNH of business certificate, which is valid for two years, as Dr. Karmora has already highlighted in the introduction. And uh, in this slide, I think this is the, again, the framework for GNH uh, of business satisfaction, certification, which again, will elaborate and speak on the later, but uh, uh, just for the, uh, the participants, I thought I'll just highlight what we have been doing on the GNH besides the public organization. When it comes to the application of uh, the uh, GNH, in budgeting at the broader level, budget allocation uh, is aligned to the plans and programs of the government. Uh, when I mentioned this, the framework is uh, designed in such a way that it aligns and it promotes to the maximization of change. So uh, when we talk about the budgeting and uh, the planning in line with the change, I think these are all taken care. In particular, where there's no application of GNH in budgeting for center programs directly, budgeting is done as part of the plan, which is premised on the foundation of enhancing GNH, uh, GNH. Hence, indirectly or direct budgeting is linked to GNH. At the local level, there's a resource allocation formula. And for the first time, the GNH index for each LG has been used in the current plan as one of the criteria to determine resource allocation to the LGs, the local governments. Uh, at the Zongha, uh, Zongha Geok, or Tromde, the district block and the uh, city with the lower GNH index score receives higher allocation of resources. So the from the survey result, if we find that the some of the songhawks and blocks and cities who has scored very less in some of the indicators of the GNH, then we have amended to allocate more resources. The other parameters also includes this at the district level, uh, the economy, they, they receive around 40%, health 10%, Education 10%, culture 10%, environment 15%, and at the city, population, uh, the weightage of the, the uh, resources that they receive as per the uh, city, they have population 15%, environment 15%, health 30%, education 15%, safety 10%, culture 5%. And at the block level, the geog level, population 15%, farming 15%, uh, health uh, 20%, education 5%, poverty 15%, and transportation uh, index, they receive around 15%. So the weightage of the GNS index has been set at 10% for geog and Tomdes and 15% for the uh, Zonkax. And in the current plan, uh, the allocation of the resources between the center and the government, I mean, and the local government is 50 50. So, and within that 50%, there is certain uh, resource allocation formula, which the, is again divided between the, the block, uh, the uh, city, urban center, and the district. 
It also encourages uh, LGs to prioritize and invest in activities related to culture, environment, waste management, pollution, health, education, poverty, safety, and human wildlife conflict, etc. So uh, these are in just the brief presentation uh, uh, focusing on the application of GNH in policy, planning, and budgeting. As enshrined in the Constitution of the Kingdom of Bhutan, in a cost to promote those conditions that will enable the pursuit of uh, gross national happiness, we ensure that all policies, plans, programs, and resource allocation are in line with the principles of GNH and ensure the conditions to maximize people's well being and happiness are put in place. Lastly, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for listening to my presentation and also like to wish everyone happiness and uh, well-being, particularly during these trying times amidst the COVID pandemic. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jasho Rinchen Wangdi. I think uh, that was a very, very uh, detailed description of the uh, GNH uh, into practice, the policy planning and budgeting areas. Uh, if anyone has any participants have any questions, uh, please send them through Q&A as we will be taking the uh, all questions at the Q&A time. So please uh, uh, do that and then uh, that will enable us to uh, answer any questions that are there. Now the next uh, area would be the measurement of uh, uh, gross national happiness or GNH and uh, uh, to give this address, uh, we have Professor Sabina Alkaya uh, who serves as the director of Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative at the University of Oxford. Previously, she worked at the George Washington University, Harvard University, the Human Security Commission, and the World Bank. She has a DPhil in economics from the University of Oxford. Together with Professor James Foster, Sabina developed the Alkaya Foster a method for measuring multidimensional poverty, which is now measured in more than 100 countries. Bhutan's GNH index is also computed using the Alkaya Foster method. She is closely engaged with CBS in measuring GNH. So I have a great pleasure uh, in inviting Professor Sabina Alkaya to uh, deliver her address. Thank you so much. It is truly an honor to be here with you, the distinguished participants, and to exchange in this panel with CMA and with institutions in Sri Lanka, with whom there is so much to share. And I'm also very grateful to be on this panel with Dasha Rinchen, Soki Zamno, Dasha Karma Oda, and of course, our friends, um, in Sri Lanka, so Lakshman Watawala and Anju and others. So thank you so much for this option. What I will share is really also the work of Dasha Karma Ura, of Tsoki Zamno, and of the team at the Center for Bhutan Studies. Tsoki Zamno, for example, was the leader both in the GNH survey and in the computations of the 2012 index. But because she has been so productive, in also doing GNH certification for business, then I will be um, sharing the GNH indexed work. So what we do in the index is try to take the concept which both the Kama Ura and Dasha Rinchen shared of GNH and its nine domains into a measure which can be used for policy and which also could inform actors in government as well as outside government about how their own or their community's gross national happiness is unfolding and how they could invest energies to increase it. And so we take the nine domains of GNH 
and identify 33 indicators. These 33 indicators draw on 124 variables um, in the survey. And they have two to four indicators within each dimension. The dimensions carry equal weight. So psychological <clears throat> well-being is as important as living standards, as important as health, as important as good governance. The indicators within each dimension are broadly equally weighted, except that if they are highly subjective, the weight is lighter. So perceptions of government or self-reported health carry a lower weight than the number of days you can work per month or whether um, you have access to good services provided by government. And across the 33 domains or indicators, what you can see is that some of them capture very normal concepts like, um, for example, in living standards, assets, income and housing, or in health, the number of days that you are healthy, or in education, your literacy and the number of completed years of schooling. But even in these traditional domains of living standards, health and education of the HDI, there are twists. So in education, what is your knowledge of local legends? of the constitution of HIV AIDS. In health, what is your mental health status, anxiety and worry and depression? And what kinds of disabilities may be afflicting you? So it is not only the domains that are broader than other indices, but also the definitions. And while the domains may be of international importance, in fact, they are the same domains that the Stiglitz Sen Petusi Commission later took up in their study for President Sarkozy, except they omitted culture. But the indicators tailor the GNH index to the context of Bhutan. For example, there is a, an etiquette of courtesy called Driglum Namsa, which came up earlier. And that is very important in Bhutan. So one of the questions is if people think it is good that this culture of courtesy is important? And is it getting stronger or weaker in the country? Also, the artisanal skills that comprise culture in Bhutan might be different in other countries. So the GNH index has a relevance in terms of the domains to Sri Lanka, but and some of the indicators could be used as they are, and others would need to be tailored to the particular um, shape of fulfillment and flourishing in, in other contexts. So first of all, how does the GNH measure differ from other measures? As we know, many groups are interested in going beyond income to look at well-being these days. And there are basically three other approaches to measurement. One, is simply to pick an indicator of happiness, such as subjective life evaluation or evaluative life satisfaction, which is used in the World Health Report, sorry, World Happiness Report. But these do not recognize the multidimensionality of happiness and well being. And also, they do not recognize other sentient beings. So the happiest countries could be those that are inflicting the most harm on the planet and other living beings, or perhaps that have less responsibility in terms of other human beings. So breakdowns in community and family. A second approach is to use the dashboard, which many governments have done of many indicators. In the UK, there were 41, 64 different dashboards of well-being. But dashboards are hard to communicate. And very importantly, they don't make trade-offs explicit. So if you only have the first, the unidimensional happiness, 
there's a question of how much happiness should have value versus GDP per capita. But if there's a dashboard that includes living standards and psychological well-being, but there are no weights, then you have not answered the question of how much do these different aspects matter when it comes to budgeting, as we saw in Bhutan. So there are composite measures that bring these together. And these could be the Better Life Index of OECD or the Social Progress Index, or even the Human Development Index. But composite measures cannot be disaggregated to show how women differ from men or rural from urban areas or across states. And usually they combine data from different sources and years and they don't have some statistical techniques. And particularly, it's sometimes not so plain what to do to increase your indicator. But there's a lot of work in this area that I commend that everyone has learned from, whether it's the research agenda of OECD following up from the Stiglitz-Sen Fatusi Commission, whether it's the Mark Fleur Bay International Panel on Social Progress, or many other innovations in the Gross National Happiness Conference community. But the GNH index takes a different approach on measurement in that it identifies each person in a household survey as um, their degree of GNH based on two thresholds. One is an indicator threshold and the other is the overall threshold across their scores. So first of all, let's think of the indicator threshold in terms of money in the GNH index. How much money do you need? In this case, it's one and a half times the poverty line. How many years of education do you need to have sufficient, the Buddhist concept of sufficiency is important here, sufficient attainment. Not that you might not personally want to go beyond, but sufficiency refers to the causes and conditions that policy can support citizens to realize. Um, and so each indicator has a cutoff that says, what are the minimum causes and conditions of GNH in a sense that should be provided by other actors? And so just to give a concrete example, this is a woman who participated in the 2015 GNH survey. And on the right hand side are the 33 indicators in that survey grouped within their nine domains. And the height of the boxes is the weight of the indicator. And if the indicator is white, it means she did not achieve sufficiency in that indicator. But you already see that we are building on each person's personal profile. And so we can go back to it. We will be able to disaggregate and to show what needs to be changed to increase GNH. So you see that the white box on spirituality is blank. The white box on literacy, she's not literate on government performance, she wasn't too pleased, on environment responsibilities. So those are some areas in which she does not have sufficiency. But if you add up the weights of the boxes, and if you look visually across them, you add up all the white boxes, it's only 16%. So 84% of the domains have sufficiency for this woman. So that is her GNH score, 84%. Mine might be 40%. Someone else's might be 70. And then the second cutoff is a happiness gradient. Um, and it says if your overall GNH score is less than 50%, then you are unhappy. If it's between a half and a third, then you're narrowly happy. If it's between a third and more than three quarters, sorry, two thirds and more than three quarters, you're extensively happy. And it's above 77%, then you're deeply happy. So in this way, Bhutan can segment its population and look at inequalities and look at different groups of the population um, by different cutoffs. So the person we spoke about, her GNH score is 84%. So she's coded as deeply happy. 
I hope that's clear. So um, I'll simply go through the intuitive results um, and not the details of technicalities. But I want to begin by saying that when we say somebody is happy or unhappy by the GNH score, we must be very careful because um, we will identify somebody as happy by the GNH if their GNH score is at least two thirds or higher. But happiness is very personal and any measure is very imperfect. So what if this really means is that you have GNH, if your GNH score is two thirds or above, you have the causes and conditions of happiness and the rest is up to you. So that's really the, the better interpretation than saying that somebody is or is not extensively and deeply happy. So in 2015, 43.4% of people had sufficiency in at least two thirds of the weighted indicators. Their GNH score was at least two thirds. And that is the cutoff in a sense to be considered as enjoying GNH. They were extensively or deeply happy. And so we can see here that um, they are the top two rows and 8.4% of the population of Bhutan were deeply happy and 35% were extensively happy. And if you add 35 and 8.3, you get 43.4. And of those who were not enjoying GNH, nearly 48% were narrowly happy and only 8.8% were unhappy. They had achieved sufficiency in less than half of the weighted indicators. So the GNH index brings in one more thing. Now we've identified who is happy but look at the unhappy people now, look at the narrowly happy people now, in what, what is their average GNH score? We know it's above 50%, but what is it? We call this in a sense, the intensity of their happiness. And although they don't have two thirds, they enjoy on average 56.9% of, of the achievements. So that is the average GNH score among the not yet happy people. So the GNH value, I'll just run through this, but you have the slides, is equal to three numbers. Look at the bottom. It's the 43.4% of people who are happy. And then of those who are not happy, 100% minus 43.4 is 56.6%. So among the 56.6%, their average achievement is 56.9%. So you multiply these two numbers together. And when you add that, it's like 43% have all everything. And then this is the proportion of GNH that's achieved by those who are not yet happy. Then you have the GNH score. And what that means is that if any of the white boxes of a person who does not enjoy GNH become white, the GNH score rises. So, five minutes to go through the findings. Overall, as I said, the GNH score is 75.6.756, um, showing that, you know, uh, it is really quite a high number and we'll go to the changes later. And if we look at men on the left versus women, men have higher GNH than women. For example, they have a lot higher in the purple box of education and a little bit higher in living standard, a little bit higher in community vitality or cultural diversity or time use or health. In fact, in no domain do women have higher absolute achievements than men. And there are actually a few more women interviewed than men. So this is representative. Um, in terms of urban and rural areas, Rural are on the left and urban are on the right. And urban areas had higher, primarily because of the more material achievements of living standards and education. Um, but you can see that in other areas like health, they are almost the same. Across the 20 districts of Bhutan, Gasa on the top and Bumtang, as you saw, and as Dasha Karma Uda said, 
have the highest levels of GNH and Tongsa Tashyangste lower. We've put this with the confidence intervals. So you see that yes, Gasa is definitely higher than Timpu, um, but Bumtang and Timpu overlap a bit. And if you look at the map of Bhutan, the darker is the higher GNH and the light green is the lower. And so it's not, it's, it's sort of spread in different parts of the country. So it's quite an interesting story because there are various ways of being happy and flourishing, not just one, not just going to an urban area. If we look at trends over time, it's very interesting. And Dashakur Maura mentioned that, first of all, there was a statistically significant increase in GNH over five years. Um, and the share of happy people increased from 40.9 to 43.4%. Is this fast growth? Is it slow growth? We don't know because it was the first change. But we can answer what drove change, what increased, and what priorities might have been in 2015. So um, across the nine domains, you see that the biggest improvement, meaning the bars go up, is in living standards. And the number of stars is the statistical significance. And all of the indicators in living standard had a statistically significant increase. But actually in seven of the nine domains, there was a statistically significant increase. They went up overall, driven by these indicators. Um, and Yet in two domains, community vitality and psychological well-being, every single indicator had a statistically significant decline. Now that's quite important because if we didn't have the GNH index and just looked at living standard or health or education, we might feel triumphant and think everything was going well. But because the GNH takes a panoramic view it can look at psychological well being and community vitality and create a conversation about how we might need to rebalance some priorities and policies to make sure that we don't lose other things that are very important as the material progress marches on. You might wonder, those who work on subjective well being, whether the life of value satisfaction evaluative life satisfaction indicator would be the same. And so just one slide to say it is not at all. That the overlap between evaluative life satisfaction and GNH is about half. And it's less than half for the GNH index. Only less than 20% of people who have high evaluative life satisfaction are happy by the GNH index. So they are measuring quite different things. And so um, we need to understand the intricate and textured picture that GNH can give in celebrating improvements where there have been improvements and raising some signals where we might need to look at shortfalls in others. And just to conclude, um, as both our chair said at the beginning and as Soki Zamna will elaborate, the metric of GNH looks at the outcomes, but a very important part of increasing GNH is not just looking at how to increase each indicator, which of course will improve GNH, but it's also looking at the processes of policymaking of private sector work and jobs to make sure that these increase GNH. And I want to acknowledge the international literature uh, in building happiness, that it has looked at the processes and it has looked at the inner life, the consciousness of managers and of workers and how can we improve mindfulness and kindness um, through mind training. So that is a brief introduction to the work of the colleagues in Bhutan on the GNH index. And we thank the chair so very much for this opportunity to share. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sabina Alka. We are, we are very, uh grateful to you for the great amount of research work we have done 
and also how you have helped the index and also for developing the alkaya foster uh, method for measuring multi multi-dimensional poverty i think that's uh, a very big uh, great achievement and uh, we are sure that uh, also the bhutan dnh index which is also computed on this method so i'm sure uh, you are uh, one of the real experts in this and we are very thankful to you uh, for making that uh, presentation and uh, informing us of uh, how the measurement of the gross national happiness index is being done. Then the next uh, item is uh, where, where we have the GNH of business. Uh, and this uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Shoki Sangmo, uh, who completed her master's from the Australian National University in Applied Statistics. She worked at the Center for Bhutan and GNH Studies as a research officer for 13 years. Currently, she serves a UNDP Bhutan country office as the head of exploration for newly established Accelerator Lab. During her stay at CBS, she has numerous publications on GNH along with Dasho Karma Ura. So I have now great pleasure in inviting Shoki Sangmo to address us. Hi, am I audible? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, fine. We can hear you. Sorry, sorry. I'll I'll have to put the internet off. Uh, internet okay. has been fluctuating yeah, yeah. here, so yeah. I'll put you it are. off to just uh, ease up the pressure on the net, and so that I do not get disconnected. Uh, I like to first of all take. A We cannot hear, hear you. Hello, am I audible? Sorry. Now, yeah, now we can hear you. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, I just wanted to thank uh, CBS and uh, Institute of Certified Management Accounts of Sri Lanka for this opportunity. Uh, let me share my um, screen. Uh, so, yes, uh, okay. the concept of uh, integrating change into, uh, into business goals and operations is, is new for Bhutan. If we, if we look around and observe a majority of uh, businesses in Bhutan, they continue to operate on a conventional business principle of maximizing profits. And, uh, and the idea was first proposed by... Um, Dashwood Sring Topke, the former Prime Minister of Bhutan, in his uh, keynote address at the, uh, the Sixth International Conference on GNH held in Paro, one of the districts in Bhutan, in 2015, he mentioned uh, that the current business model of overemphasizing on profit maximization at the cost of community well-being and environment was simply unsustainable. And 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 by and by that it, impl it implied shifting the focus of uh, business from profit only to a societal benefit and and secondly also rethinking the indicators by which success or performance of businesses were measured we know that the financial uh, report uh, you know that comes out annually or binarily from businesses around the world they often illustrate the degree to which businesses impact uh, the health uh, fail. I mean, they fail to illustrate the degree to which businesses impact the health of the environment and communities. And often a business which uh, pollutes and destroys habitats is 
is seen to rank at the top due to the mere presentation of financial sta uh, statements with higher returns. So the GNH uh, of business was, uh, was actually a, an open uh, call for businesses to rise up to the challenges that we as a society are facing and also an open call to be part of the solution rather than, than simply the problem. Hence, hence a shift uh, towards GNH would require businesses to rely not only on the economic, but also the non-economic that was mentioned by Dasha Karma Ura, Dasha uh, Rinche, and also Sabina, to focus uh, for businesses to focus on the non-economic indicators such as workers' well-being, such as contribution to the community, such as environmental conversation efforts, and so on, as uh, some of the of their success criteria. Now, uh, when this conversation on GNH of business happened, the, there, were a new, there were numerous challenges. Uh, the first one uh, being that, uh, that it restricts the free market goal of profit maximization and, and that businesses should only be accountable to its shareholders. You know, they are the, they, they, they are the, uh, the sole owners of those businesses. And also that the businesses will be are are ill-equipped to handle GNH integration. So these were some of the uh, the broad challenges that we foresaw. However, these uh, however uh, these are the very reasons why GNH must be incorporated. Uh, for instance, we know that there are only finite resources for us in the world, uh, and and a profit-only motive for business is is, is unsustainable. Likewise, an activity or an intervention by a business impacts communities and environment in varied ways and at various levels. And, and lastly, there are unlimited avenues to build capacities for businesses to think much more holistically and to ingrain long-term in the, you know, what they call long-termism in their operations. So, um, I think additionally, also the expectations, if you look around, the expectations of workers and employees and also the expectations of the public, uh, they have also evolved and they are also you know, reshaping the global economy. Workers uh, are now seek meaning in their works as opposed to viewing it as a, as a uh, to fulfill basic needs. Communities now expect businesses to be socially innovative and culturally aware and environmentally caring and so on and so forth. So in uh, 2017, the former prime minister, he launched uh, the GNH certification tool and the soul, with the sole aim to align business practices and operations towards GNH values. Now the, this GNH um, certification is a, Sorry, GNH certification is an approach uh, for a business to create goods and services using um, environmental friendly procedures in a very enabling work environment while also consciously uh, contributing to communities in which it is uh, embedded. And uh, the assessment tool, it is, uh, if you look, go through this uh, report, it is characterized by uh, its uh, simplicity it's multi-dimensional characteristic and it's data driven and also very systematic in its approach. And uh, we do know that uh, there is no one size fit all approach to designing an effective tool. So what uh, we had done back then was to emphasize the importance on the, on the well-being of both workers and communities. And that is done through uh, Two kind of uh, two two levels. Firstly, is through the workers by trying to measure workers' happiness through the worker survey, and then secondly, also trying to measure the business's commitment uh, commitment towards GNH by uh, through the management survey, as uh, as uh, projected here in the slide. Uh, administrative data is also referred from in, uh, for for analysis and inferences. 
and uh, uh, the the framework also covers a range of indicators and that too it's it's the same principle that we have followed uh, in the gnh index uh, the, the range of indicators have been uh, uh, grouped under the nine domains for instance uh, the worker happiness uh, they provide a greater primacy uh, to employ employee interest it incorporates uh, indicators uh, such as health and safety, job satisfaction, job security, flexible work, equal opportunities, equal pay, so on and so forth. And uh, the second component uh, on on the agent on the business's commitment to GNH, it uh, also uh, reflects on how it also helps monitor the responsible behavior of a business by uh, really assessing how it contributes in areas of culture, environment, and community building. And uh, this uh, integrated uh, approach um, uh, is assessed uh, through, through uh, is stressed every two or three years for a business if they want to be certified. And uh, it requires, it basically, it is uh, the method that we use is uh, similar to uh, what was outlined by Sabina. Uh, in fact, uh, we have used a modified version of the, the MPI approach. There are two level of thresholds. There's indicator level thresholds and then uh, domain level thresholds and a satisfaction of those thresholds then would uh, produce uh, uh, the, uh, the a score. Um, the assessment procedure, of course, uh, the, it involves a six-step method. Uh, started starting from screening to data collection to analysis and scoring. And uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the similar to GNH index, uh, uh, even for the business score, there's two levels sufficiency thresholds, and they all aggregate into a single score. And uh, the score guides the kind of certification to be awarded, uh, which is um, illustrated here. Uh, the idea of awarding certificates uh, through different gradations to all the businesses uh, is to firstly acknowledge uh, businesses' uh, initiative to incorporate the ideals of GNH. Uh, and also to encourage more businesses to come forward voluntarily to get it assessed. Therefore, the I think what's important for us to know here is uh, the central idea of this assessment is not to determine who fails or who passes, but to let the businesses know where they stand when measured through a GNH yardstick. The, uh, the assessment is not the end goal, but rather a starting point to bring in change. And at the end of the GNS certification assessment, issues and impacts within business operations is understood, which will further aid in developing strategies, monitoring risks, and uh, implementing uh, recommendations for uh, integrating GNS principles into the business decisions. So that's the ultimate aim. Uh, perhaps I'll end here, Professor, and uh, open the uh, session for questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, that was the area on business. And as I said earlier, that uh, uh, we also are doing uh, a similar area where the uh, financial and non-finance finance are taken in and. Uh, I mentioned about integrated reporting where uh, various aspects of the, even the capital where it's not only the financials, but also the uh, human resource, the uh, environment, uh, innovation, and so many other things are taken. So, and uh, that uh, is something that we are doing, but I think uh, we can make use of the uh, JNH that you have developed for business, uh, maybe to include some of those also. Uh, so that it will help us a great deal. So now uh, we have uh, the uh, Q&A session. Uh, what you can do is you can send your questions on uh, Q&A uh, so that we can uh, take it up. Uh, but in the meantime, I would uh, like to get some comments uh, from our 
uh, panelists and the other invitees, and there are some uh, whom I will also invite uh, from the participants uh, to uh, give their comments. So initially, can I invite uh, Dr. Anoja uh, to give your comments on uh, comments or questions that you have? Uh, thank you very much. So I'd like to say that uh, I was extremely impressed with the amount of work that has gone in to actually uh, measure uh, gross national happiness and also to develop all the indicators as well as uh, dividing it into these nine areas and the subdivisions and so on. So uh, um, it's an exhaustive uh, method of uh, monitoring uh, GNH, uh, and it is extremely detailed. Um, so um, congratulations on that score. Uh, now I'd like to, uh, if you don't mind, ask a question. Uh, Bhutan uh, moved over to a system of uh, uh, parliamentary democracy in the early 21st century. And uh, now you have a system of parliamentary democracy, which has uh, political parties and uh, a system of uh, a government where uh, uh, members of, uh, uh, you know, members who represent the public are elected. Um, now, uh, in your five-year plans, uh, uh, it was said that uh, the five-year plans are formulated regardless of uh, political changes. Now, I think that is a great uh, development uh, because then I assume that all political parties subscribe to the policies that have been indicated in the five-year plans. And there is no division among the political parties regarding the five-year plans. Can I assume that? Would someone like to take that question? Uh, thank you. Let me take this question. Uh, thank you, uh, Anujya. Uh, I think uh, when I mentioned that the framework for the planning and monitoring framework that uh, the ultimate objective, the long-term goal of the five-year plan I think we are looking beyond the five-year plan, the maximization of GNH. That framework still stands. And the larger goal of maximization of the happiness, GNH, remains, uh, 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 I mean, strong in the formulation of the, the five-year plan. So down the line, the manifesto, their pledges will be different. But all the pledges and manifesto, when they formulate their plan, I think they take into account the larger framework that they, they'll have to adhere. So I think more or less uh, from our perspective, uh, working with three governments uh, until now, we have not much of uh, the challenges that uh, have come across. And more or less, uh, it is already inbuilt in the framework that we have shared. And the one good thing is when they formulate, uh, I mean, develop this manifesto uh, campaign matters, we also uh, bring them on board, all the political parties. And we actually explain and present to the parties that this is the way that we should pursue. And on uh, most of the divisions, here and there will be at the local level, local government level, but the, at the center, the national programs, projects, I think rather than the plan writing on the political manifestos, the political manifestos write on the plan. So uh, more, more and more, uh, the political parties are becoming very much aware. And, uh, and uh, we actually wanted to uh, uh, tweet or uh, align their manifesto to the mainstream agenda. So that's how we do. And uh, this is possible because of the smallness. Thank you. 
So I, I would like to say that this is a great uh, achievement that you have made in Bhutan, uh, because if you compare that with the rest of South Asia, where political divisions are, you know, almost insurmountable, and uh, policies are changed overnight with changes uh, in, in government, I think what you have achieved is absolutely fantastic. And uh, I would actually attribute that to the fact that you have uh, a monarchy and also a king that uh, exudes confidence and loyalty among the entire population. So that, that is a great uh, asset you have, uh, the monarchy, and also the GNH itself is, is the brainchild of the fourth king, Jigme uh, Singye Vamchuk. And uh, so I think uh, it is a great advantage that you enjoy, which unfortunately is not found in the rest of South Asia. And I think this is a very, very important ingredient that has enabled you to uh, get this kind of uh, uh, conformity and acceptance for the, the long-term goals of the country. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Anoja. Now uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Guan, uh, Dr. Nuan Gunrat. Uh, he's a member of our institute plus also a senior lecturer at the University of Sri Jayawardenepura. Uh, if you can keep it uh, brief, uh, Dr. Nuan, maybe a question, and if you have any comments, uh, you can make a short comment. Uh, yes. Thank you, Professor Watavala, and providing. And thank you very much for organizing this timely and insightful session. And let me briefly tell you the approach we have taken in some of the Sri Lankan universities to discuss uh, cross-national happiness. Uh, I'm actually a senior lecturer attached to the management faculty of University of Sri Jawardhanapura. As Professor Watavala mentioned, I'm also a senior member of CMA. Now at the University of Sri Jawardhanapura, we have a course on corporate sustainability and uh, corporate sustainability account. And we would like to highlight that this is uh, for the accounting students and we teach our students the three pillars of uh, sustainability that is economic environmental and social pillars in three modules and how they can use accounting tools and techniques in planning and decision making controlling and the performance evaluation and then we have another important module that's about sustainability integration how you can achieve and maintain delicate balance between uh, three pillars of sustainability and this is where we discussed sustainability integration at the macro level, that's the national level, the meso level, that's the corporate and the industry level, and micro, the in individual level. So at the mac macro level, we discussed the national failures, such as failures to integrate sustainability, such as Nauru, the country that has the world's highest GDP, in, second highest GDP in 1970s, but now a country that faces resource depletion, economic problems, and also social problems such as obesity. And also we discuss uh, as an example for example about the national level sustainability integration, we actually discuss about cross national happiness of uh, Bhutan. And also we discuss at the second level, we look at the corporate level sustainability integration by using approaches such as uh, sustainability balance scorecard. As accountants, we are familiar with balance scorecard, but we go beyond to discuss sustainability balance scorecard. And also we discuss eco-control approach as a means of integrating sustainability at the corporate level. And uh, finally, we discuss about the uh, sustainability integration at the individual level by discussing Rampasat and Hussein's uh, 2014 uh, personal balance scorecard. And we believe that sustainability integration should happen not only within an entity, but across my, across macro, meso, and uh, micro level. So that the ultimately we try to highlight that <clears throat> individuals should play a role in achieving corporate level as well as uh, macro level sustainability or happiness uh, for this matter. So thank you very much, Professor Watavala, for organizing this important event and providing me with an opportunity to share my experiences as an educator. And uh, let me raise uh, one question. Now, uh, is that permitted? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, well, now one question I have is that, uh, you know, measuring all these indicators and collecting data is a huge challenge, even at the corporate level. So how do you do this? What sort of mechanisms do you have in place to collect the necessary data to calculate the gross national happiness index? Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, would one of our speakers like to take that up? Okay. Professor, yeah. Professor Sabina, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Sabina. Yeah. Uh, so when we talk about GNH index, we are talking the uh, purposes for changing the public policies, right? So we have two kind of ind indices. One is GNH index, and one is uh, GNH uh, business index. For the uh, for the uh, changes to bring about changes in the public uh, policies and governance. That is a survey that's carried out once every three years and five uh, or five years. And uh, for now, it's based on uh, population-based surveys. Uh, it's cross-sectional in nature, and it's, it's res highly resource intensive, but uh, there are so many, uh, I think, discourses on the way that's also happening even now. How do we make it um, uh, much more succinct? How do we make it much more, uh, much less resource intensive by embedding it uh, in the, the, the service, the regular service that's carried out by our National Statistical Bureau and so on and so forth. But because of the required nature of GNIT itself, it's a very comprehensive social survey. It's covering nine domains. It's talking about every aspect of your life, from your work-life balance to your relationship status to your mental health to your living, you know, whether you're able to live a fulfilling or a meaningful life. So it's very comprehensive. And for that matter, it does require very focused, uh, you know, focused attention and uh, time and resources. Uh, it is not like any other st uh, standard objective uh, data. A lot of uh, questions under the genus survey is subjective, and for that, uh, we require rigorous training of the enumerators. It requires a very different approach, as, 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 as it is true for any kind of social service. So that is, uh, for now, it is uh, every three, three to five years, we do try to collect uh, data on the, the nine domains of genus, the nine aspects. For the GNH of business surveys, now that's uh, much more uh, driven, uh, demand driven. For instance, uh, for uh, and I and I also wanted to point out to Dr. Nivan, I'm I'm really excited and happy to know that you have incorporated this GNH into your curriculum in Sri Lanka. I mean, we are also trying to do the same here. CBS has reached out to a lot of business schools trying to incorporate this uh, business schools and because ultimately in order to, be, uh, to bring behavioral change in the private sector, you need to nurture those future CEOs and you know those entrepreneurs. So already there are talks underway with our business uh, university, uh, school here. In Bhutan, how do we incorporate this uh, concept of GNH certification in their curriculum? But again, going back to your question, for the GNH, it's demand driven. So if a business or a private entity or a private firm is interested to be certified uh, with the GNH certificate, then that's when they actually bring up the, the first step is for them to write to the institute, the CBS. And then the second is to look at, uh, we have a very uh, list of criteria so based on that criteria, then uh, we approach them and whether they are eligible. For instance, for the genus certification, an institute or a private firm has to be, at least they have to be operating you know, for two years. So uh, once they have done that, then it's fairly simple. The worker survey, it's fairly short. It's not very lengthy like, uh, like in the GNH uh, uh, survey. So it's short and the other, for the management survey, it's much more administrative driven. If you actually go through the, uh, the report, you'll see that the most of the questions that we ask are those that have been already collected by the administration or the management in some way or, uh, in some way or others. So uh, that way, the administrative burden for the GNH of business survey is, I feel it's much lesser. What we are trying to do is again streamline it further and also institutionalize it, especially for state-owned uh, enterprise enterprises. So, uh, as Dash Karmaura mentioned, like DGPC or the Druk Holding Investment Companies, for those, uh, the government might might make it mandatory for them to collect this uh, this kind of data maybe in every two years, so that they are aware of where they stand. But for the worker survey, as I mentioned, it's, it's fairly short. So 
the administrative burden and the resource, uh, it's fairly, it's, it's, it's quite simple for the GNH of business, but for the, the other one, for the GNH index, it's very comprehensive and it should be because we are trying to look at this, you know, we are trying to adopt this alternative, this multidimensional approach towards uh, assessing progress. So that's it. And if Tasho or Sabina would like to add. Thank you. I think, uh, Professor Sabina, you, you have a few comments, I think. No, I think that Toki covered, covered it in terms of the data source. I think that it's a very exciting data source. And as Toki said, I think that there are innovations possible um, and that would make it more widespread. People would want to know on social media what their status is, um, how it changes. Um, but I think that those are really for the future. It's important to have an official national statistic based on household survey data. Thank you, Professor Sabina. I think, uh, Mr. Ruchira, you, you have a comment or question? Can I also tell? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. You're muted. Yeah, you're muted. Yeah. Ruchira, you're muted. Yeah, well, Professor, thank you very much, first of all, for organizing this conference. And also, my I thank for the Center of uh, Study Center of Bhutan Studies, uh, Ghost National Happiness Index uh, implementation team, and also for the speakers who have come here and deliberated as to how it was implemented in Bhutan. Uh, the two questions, Professor, the first question is about the Buddhist philosophy. I want to ask from them whether I have read somewhere that Ghost National Happiness Index was created based on the middle path of Buddhism, uh, based on the middle path of Buddhism, uh, thinking that happiness is accrued from a balanced act rather than from extreme approaches. Is, is there any truth in that? And also uh, how the gross national happiness index is uh, different, how it is compared with the OECD better life index and also SPI index. So those are the two questions also. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, anyone likes to take it up, uh, our speakers? You comment on the measurement part. Um, that in terms of the OEC Better Life Index, so I mentioned that the Stiglitz Sen Fitusi Commission um, under President Sarkozy recommended that to measure quality of life, the measurement not focus on GDP per capita but rather that it consider eight domains of well-being and quality of life, which were health, education, living standards, cult, um, community and relationships, so voice and agency, uh, governance, um, time use, and uh, psychological well-being, um, and the environment. But they did not recommend culture. So it's the same as the nine domains of GNH. When the OECD turned that into a better life index, it turned it into 11. So it took the living standard dimension and it made it into four. Um, and it is a composite HDI style indicator um, with 11 instead of three domains. And the weight of the domains, the rest position is equal, but on the website, you know, you can change the weight if you want to. Um, but basically the difficulty with that is that the weights um, as create a comparability, a marginal rate of substitutability that's not transparent. And it depends on the amounts of achievement in other domains. So it's difficult to use it for policy. And also it cannot be disaggregated subnationally by men, women, Zonkug, which means it's difficult as a policy tool. In terms of the social progress index, um, that as you know, has again, 12 dimensions um, 53 indicators. The methodology is not transparent, so you can't replicate it based on the information available on the internet. But it, it is again, primarily at the national level. In a few countries, they've done some subnational studies. Um, and so it's not the case where each person has a profile of GNH. It's not the case where you can see how men compare to women, rural to urban children or farmers to other people. So it, it's just, it doesn't have that agility because you're bringing together different surveys from different data. You use census questions in the 
um, SPI, Social Progress Index. And so some of them don't change except for every 10 years and others might change often. So it's, it's just a different marker. If you need a marker at the national level that's not available um, subnationally um, and that has updates at different varieties, the advantage of those indicators is they combine surveys. They, none of them have a GNH survey. They just pull together from different data sources. So those are the main measurement differences. In terms of Buddhism and the other path, I would defer to Tsoki and Dasha Rinchen. The only thing I would say is that uh, Dasha Karma Uda has a paper in progress, an academic paper, where he's drawn out the Kanjur texts and how each of them treat the nine domains of GNH um, to articulate, based on the Kanjur, um, the distinctive value each of them have for overall flourishing. <laughs> but over to others for a more in-depth uh, treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabina. Anyone wants to, uh, any of the others want to make any comments? So it, there is a question. I will just uh, read it for you. Uh, that's from Purshid Alam. Uh, many thanks, uh, Shoki, Professor Sabrin and Dasho. Uh, you have ignited a lot of thoughts. Bhutan has been a star in imagining and applying GNH in its development and social affairs. I think it must, uh, stroke can be adopted by all countries, industry, academia, where GDP is the political currency. I would like to hear your view how adoption can be incentivized. Would COVID be a reset button to shift towards happiness as central piece. In similar way, how to make a G, how to make a GNH as a part of business case? Many thanks. So maybe uh, Shoki, you like to take it up first, or any, or any of the other speakers who want to? I'll I'll just. Try. I'll read, shall I read the question? I would no, like no. To I a, think I under, okay. yeah. I think okay. uh, GNH as a business case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are I think uh, indefinite number of uh, you know scientific journal articles that actually talk about uh, how uh, about short termism and long termism. And GNH is always talking about long termism, and uh, you know a lot of um, growth in the private sector firms and corporations these days. They are much more uh, they are much more geared towards uh, you know getting incentives or profit or returns in the short period of time, and rather not think about the future. So uh, I think there already is a gene. Gene it itself it offers a business case for the for the business firms. You know the, the thought that you know you are you are talking about workers' well-being as opposed to workers uh, you know uh, overloading them with work or causing them distress at work uh, workplaces and so on. So it itself, I mean, workers, they, they actually stand for productivity. So if you want to improve your productivity of your company, then the, the, what is the one thing that you need to do? You need to make your workers or employees happy. So the GNH of business itself, I would feel personally, and I'm sure Ashkarma Ura, my former boss, will also agree. It itself offers a business case. I mean, if you look in depth, that uh, just uh, choosing workers' well-being in the long term would bring a greater uh, profit margin to that company. Likewise, wherever this company or firm is uh, located, you know, what does the what what is it that you're bringing to the local community, and who is this local community? The local community are your clients; they are your consumers. So, if you take care of them, if you take care of the environment in their uh, in which they are living, if you take care of the culture, if you take care about the uh, the vitality, if you bring about vitality in that community, you are just expanding your com consumer base. So if you look at that conceptually, this is what I'm sharing, but there are so many uh, scientific evidences backing the, the, the argument that I'm trying to make. The GNIT itself is a business case for any kind of firm or a corp or corporation. 
I just also wanted to touch upon the Buddhist, uh, the Buddhist and, you know, what are the commonalities between Buddhism and GNH? I mean, if you look back into history, some of the, there are many scriptures that was, uh, that came about by uh, our first uh, leader, which is Shabdung Aung Namgyal. He came from Tibet and he was the one who unified Bhutan. And there are scriptures written by him that talks about happiness and well-being, talks about people's, uh, you know, how uh, governance should be, the, the, the purpose of a governance should be to bring about well-being of the people. So I definitely uh, feel that uh, GNH is, a precipitation or, you know, some kind of a, uh, some uh, default de default uh, model of governance. Uh, so it, it, it actually emanated from Buddhist uh, principles. And because of that, it always, if you look at uh, uh, the, the values of, you know, GNH, it talks about interdependence. That's, that's also being talked about uh, in the Buddhism, right? It talks about how uh, it talks about holistic uh, view. And that's very similar to Buddhism uh, philosophy. So there's so many, uh, you know, overlaps there. And I would definitely feel that these are GNH. It came about uh, from this Buddhist philosophy and, 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 uh, and perhaps it's one of the reasons why his majesty has really taken heat because uh, being Buddhist himself, you know, how do you bring this spiritual aspect in the uh, and then put it into policy making and decision making and affect the lives of people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chokhi, uh, I promise Chokhi, I, uh, have small, I promise yeah. I have a small question there. I yeah, just want yeah. to find out recently uh, the world has uh, given these uh, quality of life indicators and the Kanda has been declared as number one country in the world. Why this GNH stands in uh, Canada? Anybody knows about that? Perhaps I can take that. First of all, um, in terms of Khurshid's question, um, there is, I think, an international moment after COVID where it would be very appropriate to take the GNH index of Bhutan to the international level. Um, some examples, the Global Solutions Summit um, in Germany, based in Germany, which works a lot with the World Economic Forum and has been in touch to um, consider how to advance measures of well-being quite seriously, um, as has the chair of the G7, which is also going to be in Germany. And there are also discussions on the G20 about different measures. And if you think of mental health, if you think of loneliness, if you think of the need for mindfulness to control anxiety, depression, and so on, these are fundamental domains of the GNH index that have come up very strongly in COVID. Um, as has worker satisfaction with so many workers resigning their jobs. So I think that there is a, a demand and the challenge will be twofold. One will be data sources. And uh, my research team is actually looking to see if we can make some example GNH indices from data sources um, in other countries, just to get the conversation started. But the second is that of course, in this year when Bhutan is doing a new GNH index, the focus has to be on Bhutan and on using it domestically for policy. But the hope might be that the following year, there would also be some leadership and guidance from Dasha Rinchen and from others about how the GNH index can be used for policy. What are the kind of innovative tools in community, in mental health, in psychological well-being, spirituality, which Bhutan could add to the conversation because I think there is a great deal of admiration outside, but it cannot come at the cost of using this work domestically for the betterment of Bhutan, uh, particularly at a time when the economy is, is fragile. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Sabina. Can I ask you about that question that was asked by uh, Mr. Bosala about uh, Canada? Now, Canada, uh, where they say that uh, they are the best uh, country for maybe uh, it does not mention happiness, but uh, maybe on the living standards is the best. Uh, do you have any connection on that or comments yes. on that? So certainly there are um, university initiatives that do measure well-being in Canada and have for at least a decade, um, but these are not official measures by government. 
Um, and so there are many innovations, as you know, in Canada, in the Netherlands, in New Zealand, in UAE, in uh, Mexico, in states of India on measuring well-being. Um, but in terms of coming into prominence and the kind of centrality to policy that we would wish, um, it's still in the, the earlier phase. So we very much look forward uh, as these measures develop, of course, we track them. Um, I teach the stuff, um, but they're not yet developed into policy tools, which is really essential. Um, and so one looks forward to, to seeing how that will happen. Thank you, Professor Sabina. But can I ask uh, Dr. Anoja with uh, maybe a final comment uh, you have? Actually, uh, if you don't mind, I have... Uh... One little question, Professor Sabina. Uh, at the time I was asking questions, actually you were not, uh, not, not visible. Uh, so could I please ask this question before I make any comment? Uh, now in that uh, slide that you showed of the results of the nine uh, domains and the subdivisions of those nine domains, under good governance, you had uh, government performance. And uh, there I noticed that uh, the biggest uh, negative uh, bar you had there was under government performance. Uh, now, have you ascertained the reason for that? Uh, because yes, if it is being uh, if it is being fed back into government policy, uh, what is it that uh, the that indicates? I'd like to know. Yes, and Soki can also elaborate further, or Dasha Rinchen. But uh, the baseline, remember, was 2010, and Bhutan became a democracy in 2008, and so it was the honeymoon. And in a honeymoon period, everyone is fantastically positive. So the perception of good governance was up in the 90s. Um, but perhaps in the honeymoon period, it's not so realistic. So five years later, this is a perceptual question. So it has a light weight because we know it will be changed by frame of reference um, and by personality. So it's um, a, a question with a lighter weight in the GNH index because the trends are difficult to ascertain because of the frame of reference changes then you cannot interpret the indicator like you can an objective one. So the frame of reference perhaps changed and it went down by 46% percentage points. Um, but that perhaps is more of a, a coming to understand more deeply the functionings of the democratic processes, what that can and cannot deliver. Um, and so, but I, I think that Dasha Rinchen or Tsoki could say more, but I can say that uh, the perceptual questions are known to have this difficulty in interpretation because if I'm very happy because I'm comparing myself to my mother and my aunt who've lived in my village for ages, I might be very happy in terms of health. But if I compare myself to somebody in the capital city, somebody who has brilliant teeth and very well in, in her old age, then all of a sudden my subjective or perceptual uh, response will go down a lot. So that probably happened in the governance indicator, but but other colleagues can say more. Okay, what I would now do is, uh, I can ask uh, maybe for each of our speakers, uh, uh, commencing from Dasho Rinchen, uh, to give a short uh, comment uh, before we wind up. <clears throat> Dasho? Uh, Thank you, moderator. Thank you. I think uh, this forum has been very excellent to provide our views and also to uh, share what we are actually doing in Bhutan in terms of uh, mainstreaming and operationalizing the GNH. And uh, to sum up, I thought uh, the if you pursue the GDP model which is not holistic and wholesome, I think there's no end to it and it's not sustainable. But if you take up the GNH model, uh, which includes the GDP as one of the component, critical component, I think the, the way that the world is pursuing 
the sustainable development goals. I think we are perfectly aligned and we, uh, our GNH principles and the SDG uh, uh, are perfectly aligned and is integrated, well mapped. So the, the way the, the model that we pursue uh, currently uh, in the, uh, the, the planning process, the budgeting resource allocation, I think we are okay. And we thought that uh, this is the way to actually go. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, can I invite Professor Sabina, maybe short comment? Thank you so much. I have been very grateful to CMA um, for this event and to Dr. Nguyen for hearing how similar ideas are being taught. For me, it is very important to have these kinds of alliances because if different actors in different countries can innovate and teach, then ideas will bubble up. Um, and then if they bubble up in official channels in the government and also in the private sector that can move much faster than government in many contexts, um, there could be uh, energy to make a shift. And as one of the questioners mentioned, this is the time for a shift. Um, I think there's a hunger for a shift. And so hopefully this conversation will not end here and that listeners on this call will feel welcome to join, to look at grossnationalhappiness.com, which is the website which has many of the documents we've referred to and to innovate in your own context, business or government um, and share what you are doing because I think it's a, it's a time for creativity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Sabina, can I invite uh, Shoki? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, uh, CMA, really, for this opportunity. It's been an honor uh, to share the platform with uh, Dr. Shukarora, Professor Sabina, and um, Dr. Rinchen. I uh, just wanted to just summarize on the GNH of business because with the GNH uh, uh, index for public policies, I think uh, it's been more than 10 years uh, and two rounds of national surveys and a lot of uh, efforts in the screening tools and uh, on the budget allocation formula. So there has been some momentum, but with the drainage of business, it's still at a very infant stage. So just wanted to uh, reiterate that uh, we hope to bridge the gap between the drainage concept and uh, the business practice. Uh, through this uh, certification tool and um, uh, provide a standard and a reliable measure of happiness for business entities. Uh, all in all, the tool attempts to be the, um, the moral compass for business leaders so that they're able to steer the company towards uh, greater societal well-being and happiness. And, and rightly so, because uh, around the world, if you look at uh, some of the multinational companies, their GDP is much larger than uh, some of the countries. And uh, they uh, hold a lot of power, they hold a lot of influence. So with uh, great power, as we usually hear, with great power comes great responsibility. So I think a GNH for business or the GNH certification tool is a way to influence those businesses to bring about a greater societal uh, impact. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shoki. Uh, I had br brought in one uh, participant, uh, Dinesh Butejo. Dinesh, uh, do you like to make a short comment? Uh, because you have been, uh, you are here. Do you like to make anything or? Okay, right, fine. Uh, so what I, uh, our, I think our panelists have already made the comments due to the, uh, we have uh, just uh, passed our time limit. So uh, unless you have any special comment, uh, our panelists who are there, do you, can I, can I uh, do the uh, concluding remarks? Is it okay or you want to make any special comments you have? No problem, it's okay. Okay, right. thank you. Uh, thank you, so uh, let me, uh, uh, thank everyone. Uh, uh, the CBS, I think they've done a very excellent job. And I must thank uh, Jigmi uh, Funso. Actually, he's been coordinating uh, with all, all our speakers and also with us and uh, done a very, very excellent job. So I must uh, thank him because I think uh, this would be the start 
but I'm sure that uh, looking at what we discussed, uh, the very, very important areas which the speakers have outlined, starting with uh, Dacho Karma Ura, who is really, uh, uh, they gave the uh, in introduction to the Gross National Happiness and followed by Dacho Rinshan Wangdi and then Professor Sabina uh, Alka and Shoki Sangmo. And then of course, uh, our uh, panelists, uh, we had Dr. Anoja and then uh, Ruchira and uh, Kosala and of course Dr. Nguan, uh, who is also our member and helping with the uh, university. So let me thank you because uh, this I think is uh, uh, eye-opener for all of us because today with the pandemic uh, what we are looking at is of course uh, uh, for everyone to be happy. There are a lot of uh, difficulties that people are undergoing but certainly uh, uh, we can uh, see what are the problems they are having and then see how these can be uh, sorted out. So uh, I'm indeed uh, thankful to CBS, uh, the Center for uh, Business Studies in Bhutan together with uh, Gross National Happiness uh, Studies uh, for working jointly with uh, CMA. And uh, this is a start and there are a lot of uh, commonalities of what we are doing, uh, which uh, I think we can share with you and also that uh, we would like to work with you. And uh, I'm sure that uh, maybe more details uh, could be worked out uh, later. And uh, we will also be planning a few more seminars in this area uh, once we get uh, the feedback from our participants. So once again, uh, uh, I must also thank uh, from our side, uh, Ms. Shanti. Uh, within a few days, uh, we were able to circulate uh, our membership and those who are in the corporate sector and others. And today being a Sunday, it's not an easy thing to get uh, uh, participants, but uh, we thought that we should not uh, postpone this because uh, this will really be a starting point uh, to many more good things, uh, cooperation between uh, the two countries, Bhutan, there was also mentioning of uh, Buddhism, certainly, uh, maybe uh, uh, I will be contacting you all later on those matters, plus also on the gross uh, national happiness, uh, where we can also see how this index could be implemented in certain areas with uh, our assistance, because I said that we've gone into integrated reporting, which also has certain similarities, so it will be a, a good area uh, that we would like to uh, get involved. So once again, let me thank uh, all our speakers, our panelists, and all our uh, participants uh, for this uh, seminar. And I'm sure that uh, you all would have gained a lot from this. Uh, this is, I think, uh, uh, the first seminar that we have had uh, uh, on the gross national happiness. And I don't think that I, uh, we have seen very many happening but uh, this can be a start for very much more closer cooperation that would uh, be there between our two countries and also the CPMs. So let me once again thank uh, everyone. And I'm sure that uh, we will be able to keep in touch and uh, uh, work towards uh, uh, the uh, attaining or achieving gross national happiness, uh, which is uh, a major uh, factor that would uh, help all our countries. As I said earlier, maybe Harvard University, or Oxford and other places are doing it, even in Sri Lanka, uh, what Dr. Nuan mentioned in Sri Javardhan University. But we will, from CMA, uh, be uh, taking a very, very uh, major, play a major role in taking this forward. So thanks uh, once again, and wish you all the very best. Thank you, so will, thank you. So we will now conclude our seminar. And, thank you, uh, Professor. We'll, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you. Thanks. Thank thanks. You. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Professor Sabina. I know that you are in the UK. I expect quite early for you there. Okay. Right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. We keep in touch. Okay. Bye. So we will end up now.